Good morning. So, yep, we have a few people out this morning, and uh, my wife is one of them. She's at a uh, uh, camp. She's helping Southeast do a camp this week for uh, the elementary kids. So she's out, and with Chris out, I know we're going to have at least two people watching on YouTube. So I'm just going to remind anybody on YouTube watching, camera does add 50 pounds at least. So So hypothetically, uh, go with me into a story here. Your son who confessed Christ as the Lord throughout the course of his childhood, was baptized in his faith to proclaim his salvation in Jesus. He had grown up believing, uh, believing, grew up in church, studied and memorized scripture, and while at home, seemed to follow his Lord in front of both friends and family. He was a child who attended youth camp, And would come home excited for those who accepted Jesus during that camp. Felt the fire upon return home from camp, as most youth youth do. Graduates high school and is now attending college. You're not worried. Your child has a strong foundation in Christ. He's even enrolled in a course on New Testament studies. You're so proud because your son is growing in faith, even in his courses that he's taking in college. Then you get a phone call. Dad, Mom, I have to tell you, I won't be going with you to church anymore. I don't think I can believe in Jesus again. I've learned in my class that the scribes that recorded the New Testament Uh, throughout the years, have made errors upon their recordings. Um, I've learned that the New Testament original texts, they can't be found. My professors helped me to understand that Jesus can't be God because the God of the Bible unfairly asks too much of those who have sinned. The Bible's flawed. I can't believe it. How would you react How could this have been prevented? How better could you have prepared your child before going off to college? Teenagers, how can you keep this from happening to you? And parents, what do you do to keep this from being your story? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and will wander off into myths. Bart Ehrman, who is a professor of New Testament studies at North Carolina Chapel Hill, who at one time claimed to be a Christian and is now a professing atheist, has written such books as, misquoting Jesus, God's Problem, How Jesus Became God, Heaven and Hell, A History of the Afterlife, The New Testament, and Whose Word Is It, and many more. Bart states that while he was a believer in Jesus, he was hung up on what he thought to be contradictions in the Bible, but confesses that those contradictions were really nothing to be hung up on. That all those points were actually able to be worked out. 
His main issue, he says, really stems from the fact that he did not want to accept a God who required death for those who have sinned. It's in Bart's classes where kids are taught about so-called errors in the Bible, mistakes that scribes have made, Issues that can be found in doctrine, such as the so-called truth of Jesus when he was on the cross. It is professors and teachers like Bart who mislead young men and women to contemplate the authenticity and the truth of the Bible. It is as if they're asking, did God actually say? Did God actually say? The very question that Satan asked in his first encounter with a human. The deceiver was trying to get humanity to question the words of God right from the start. This is why I believe the most important question for any Christian to answer. Why do you choose to believe the Bible? If you don't consider that the most important question, I'm confident the question you do find most important originates from the Bible. This means you will ultimately need to address the initial question. We no longer live in a world that allows us to walk through life as a Christian without being ridiculed or shamed. Our culture wants to intellectually look down upon us as if we're walking in ignorance. We must be able to stand firm in the confidence that the Bible is God's word and that we will trust in all that is written within the contents of this book. So let's turn to Peter, 2 Peter 1, and we're going to start at verse 16. This is going to be today's text. We're going to revisit it a a couple times as we go through this. So starting at verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born in him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in dark places until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So this morning, I'm going to take up three points from this verse that will help us be confident that the Bible is the true word of God. So number one, our point is, because the Bible tells me so. But wait a minute. You can't go there, right? That's circular reasoning. That's crazy. You can't conclude an argument based on circular reasoning. But wait, at the, look at, let's look at the standards that the Bible holds itself in. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Isaiah 55.11, so, is, so is my sword that goes out from my mouth. I will not return, it will not return empty, I'm sorry, but will accomplish what I desire, and achieve the purposes from which I sent it. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Psalm 119, your word is a lamp from my feet 
and a light unto my path. The scriptures that I just read clearly states that this is the word of God. Therefore, it cannot contain one fallacy. It must be perfect as God is perfect. There's no other quote, unquote, holy book like the Bible. I mean, let's take a look at the complexity of how the Bible was, was compiled. This book has been written over the course of 1,500 years with a compilation of 66 books written by over 40 authors from all walks of life, kings to servants, written on three separate continents, Africa, Asia, Europe, it was written in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. There's no other book like this. The complexity of how this compilation of scriptures was put together is one thing. But to have a harmonious flow throughout the entire compilation is nothing less than supernatural. This is the hand of God. So I wanted to take a look at the photo that we put on the screen. This is a visual image that shows all the cross-references within the Bible. There's a bar chart at the bottom, all those white and gray lines. And these represent all the chapters in the Bible, starting at Genesis 1 on the left and ending with Revelation 22 on the right. The Bible cross-references itself over 63,779 times without error. Man fails time and time again to find a contradiction. What an amazing God we serve. This is a rainbow I can be proud of. Point two. Eyewitnesses. Again, Second Peter, starting at 16. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Peter was with James and John on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. They heard the actual voice of God and seen Jesus in a glorified state. These men walked with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They learned from Jesus. They experienced the supernatural miracles. They seen him heal the blind the deaf, the lame, and the sick. They watched him cast out demons, feed the multitudes, raise the dead, and walk on the water. They were eyewitnesses and wrote down their experiences during the time of other eyewitnesses who could have easily discredited them with any errors within their writing. This validates their Gospels. This validates the book of Acts, as well as the, letter of Paul, or the letters of Paul. But to me, personally, to me, what I believe is the strongest evidence to their witness is that they were willing to lay their lives down for what they experienced and witnessed with Jesus. According to church tradition, Peter was crucified upside down under Nero's reign, feeling unworthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. Andrew was crucified in an X-shaped cross in Greece. He preached to his tormentors until his death. James the Greater, he was the first apostle to be martyred according to Acts 12, verses 1 and 2. He was put to death by the sword. 
by the orders of King Herod. John, well, it's believed he died of old age. But he was persecuted, outcasted to the island of Patmos. It is said that he survived boiling oil, being boiled in oil. But he lived to write the revelation of Jesus Christ. Philip was crucified upside down. Nathaniel was cut open and beheaded. Thomas was believed to have been martyred in India where he was speared to death. Matthew was martyred in Ethiopia. James the Less was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. Thaddeus was clubbed to death. Simon the Zealot was martyred by being sawed in half in Persia. And Paul, as we know, faced severe persecution, including imprisonment, beatings, and ultimately beheaded in Rome under Nero. They were beaten, persecuted, and martyred. They went to death over their witness, and no one, not one, renounced their faith of their witness. They were confident in death. Why? Because they saw the stone rolled away. They touched his side where he was pierced. They watched him ascend to heaven. My last point, fulfilled prophecy. So 2 Peter 1, 19-21, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in dark place until the day draws, or till the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. For the sake of time, I'm only going to speak of the prophecies of Jesus. I could get wrapped up in prophecies on Israel. We could go into other areas of prophecy, but I want to focus on Jesus. There were over 300 Old Testament prophecies written about the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. His virgin birth, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, a Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. The location of his birth, Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem, you are small among the clans of Judah. Out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Three, him being a descendant of David, Jeremiah 23, 5, and Isaiah 11, 1. His flight to Egypt as a child, Hosea 11, 1. His ministry in Galilee, Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. His performing miracles, Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. And his resurrection, Psalm 16, 10. But I want to look at two specifically. The first being Isaiah 53. This prophecy was written by Isaiah over 700 years before Jesus walked the earth. And it seems like every time I get a chance to be up here, I always keep coming back to Isaiah 53. And for any of you that really know Isaiah 53, it's just remarkable what it covers. It says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him, 
like a young plant. And like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. And no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief. And as for one whom men hide their face, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that was led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, And they made his grave with the wicked, with a rich man in his death, although he had no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Is there any question here? It seemed God wanted to know, wanted us to know so clearly that no one could miss the fact that this was written about Jesus. Mankind now has ran out of excuses. But if 700 years isn't enough of a prophecy written about Jesus, let's do one more. Let's look at Psalm 22. Psalm 22 was written nearly a thousand years before Jesus walked the earth. Back in the first century, they didn't have chapters and verses like we do in our Bible. We have only had chapters and verses for a few hundred years. So back in the first century, to get, a, to get to a particular psalm, you would have to find the title of the psalm, which in this case would have been got called, My God, My God, Why Have You Forsaken Me? Jesus is calling out the title of the psalm while he's being crucified. How many who were at the foot of the cross, who had knowledge of the Psalms of David, knew exactly what he was saying. Psalms 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? For the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest, yet you are holy Enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted and delivered them. And you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, not a man. Scorned by mankind. Despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him to rescue him. For he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you I cast from my birth. I was cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have, made, have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My tongue sticks to my my jaw. You lay me in the dust of death. 
for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. This was written a thousand years before Jesus' crucifixion by a man who had never seen crucifixion. Crucifixion hadn't been invented yet when this was written. How much more of a description could God have given to provide proof for not only the authenticity of the Bible, but the fact that Jesus is truly the Son of God? He is the one who is to come. I also wonder when a Jewish person reads the encounters in Psalm 22 and in Isaiah 53, if they believe that those scriptures actually came from the New Testament. So in closing, I gave you three points as to why the Bible is the word of God. I didn't go into detail regarding the 25,000 archaeological digs that have validated the Bible. And again, not one time have there been a finding to disprove or contradict God's word. You see, God loves you. He wants you to be confident in him. He wants you to know who he is, to seek him. To trust his word. Know your king. Your Lord by hearing and reading his word. Prepare yourselves young people. For you will have friends. Who will mock you. Enemies who will make fun of you. Leaders who will try and make you second guess God's word and that Jesus truly is the Christ. Be on guard, parents, because there will be teachers, professors, and friends who will attack your child's faith and yours. Seek to pull them from what they have been taught. Guard their hearts, guard their minds. Be confident, Christians, because when the enemy asked, did God really say? You stand firm and respond. For it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Let's pray. Father God, we just praise you so much for time and time again showing us that you are the one true God. That your word is true and has been proven to be true time and time again. Father, we thank you that you've gone through so many different ways of, of showing us the uniqueness of your word. That man could not have conceived what is in the walls of your Bible. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the prophecies of Jesus. For his life. For his death. For his resurrection. Father I pray over this congregation. I pray that you would help us. To stand firm. When the enemy attacks. I pray that you would guard the hearts. Of the children who continue to. Be taught. Against your word. May they stand firm. I pray for their parents that, again, they would stand firm in their own battles 
but also that they would continue to teach your word to their own children in confidence. Father, your word does not go out in in vain, and it doesn't come back void. I praise you this day for your goodness. May you get the glory for all things, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.